Welcome to Appaloosa, More Than Just a Color Breed, a podcast dedicated to showing the world the versatility and adaptability of the Appaloosa horse, as well as the people devoted to preserving and enhancing this outstanding breed. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for joining me at the only podcast that talks about the Appaloosa horse. This is episode number 24. Today, I have a conversation with John Kreider. John and Julie are the owners of Sawyer Creek Appaloosas, which is located in northern New York at the foothills of the spectacular Adirondack Mountains. John has been at this location for well over 40 years, and his experience in Appaloosa horse breeding goes all the way back to the 1950s. As a matter of fact, John is a second generation Appaloosa horse breeder. So before we get into the conversation, Let's go over to the event calendar and see what's happening in the world of Appaloosa. Okay, so for the month of February, I don't really have anything else left, but over in the beginning of March, on March 1st through the 3rd, the Texas APHC is holding their winter national at the Extraco Event Center in Waco, Texas. The judges will be Jody Finkenbinder, Melissa Prelo, Jeff Ray, and Rod Safty. You can pre enter online at www.texasaphc.com slash entry. For stall information, you can call Beth Bass at 979-220-7299 or email bathcapstoneranch at gmail.com. On March 2nd, the Delaware Appaloosa Year-End Awards Banquet is being held in Felton, Delaware at the Felton Fire Hall. Doors are open to anyone. If you are interested in attending, contact Tammy at 302-526-6499 or dahashow at gmail.com for more information. And on March 16th and 17th, there's a trail and distance riding workshop that is suitable for riders of all level. The workshop will be held west of Homedale, Idaho on Highway 201. This is the same place that the OYE River Challenge Endurance and Trails are held. So if you want to get more information on that, I'm sure you can contact Karen Bumgardner and she can point you in the right direction. So let's go ahead and get into the interview. Hey, John, how you doing? All right. Good to hear from you. Let's go ahead and start the show like we always do. Go ahead and introduce yourself and kind of tell us a little bit about who you are and that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, well, I uh, grew up in Springfield, Missouri, uh, and my dad, uh, when I was a, a wee kid, my dad started in Appaloosa's in the early 50s, and so I was, uh, you know, sort of a, a spectator. Uh, and we went from Missouri to Idaho and picked up a couple of stallions from Almond, Mains, And uh, he bred uh, a number of mares for quite a few years. My brother was, uh, much older brother, was uh, heavy into Appaloosas in Springfield there as well. And uh, I guess uh, Dad's claim to fame was that he won the Heritage class in 63, I think it was, when, when you know, they were wearing 200-year-old, uh, you know, Eagle bald eagle feather cost you know original costume so forth and so on and he did a bit of judging and so forth. Uh, when I was a teenager, I lived on a horse and the only showing I did really was in the trail class. Uh, Jim Wilde had some great shows there in Sercoxie and uh, so uh, I was uh, pretty successful in uh, trail and uh, the the best uh, <clears throat> I had the uh, best time I had was beating my brother. So uh, <laughs> that was quite an accomplishment for me. So anyway, then, you know, life happens. You get married, college, uh, work, so forth and so on. But when I got settled here in northern New York, the first thing I did is start looking for a farm. And uh, so 76, I bought this farm, been on here 42 years. And the first thing I did was go back to Missouri and get my old 18 year old Appaloosa mare. And, uh, she spent another 11 years up here, and so I've been breeding a few Appaloosas ever since then. Uh, Julie came uh, to Sawyer Creek uh, 20 years ago, and 
we decided to, uh, she's from the halter, the quarter horse halter industry, and uh, we decided to try to, to meld the two. And uh, so that's what we've been doing, trying to breed uh, colored uh, halter horses, which is uh, an uphill task, uh, you know, with the outcrossing and so forth. But, well, uh, you know, we feel pretty good about what we've accomplished. And uh, it's, uh, it's just a passion with both of us. We just can't help ourselves uh, but doing it. But, uh, I'm in, uh, you know, 74 now and in a position where I'm slowing down as best I can. But uh, so that's that's where we are. We've sent horses all over the country and some overseas and down south and so forth. And, uh, you know, feel like we've uh, 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 added something to the breed for, you know, for the future. And uh, so that that's really kind of what we're about. Okay. So what took you from Missouri to New York? That's kind of a big move. Yeah, it was. Well, I uh, went to uh, school in the uh, University of Missouri and uh, at Rolla uh, in uh, graduate school in geology. Took a job up in the UP of Michigan and then came here to work in the zinc mines and the uh, talc mines and so forth and been here since 71. And it's a fascinating, absolutely fascinating place for a geologist. and. Uh, Mines are still operating only on a much reduced basis, like like me. And uh, anyway, so yeah, I settled in here and said, um, "This is where I want to be." It's it's beautiful up here, but it's you know you got to be tough. But uh, if you're going to be out and and survive the winters and everything, but it, it it is absolutely gorgeous up here, and we really like it. So this is home, and uh, this is where we're going to stay. So yeah, it was quite a move, but uh, you know we get to. Uh, I, I I was really lucky though. I got to uh, as a young man and and uh, in college and so forth with the parents. I got to see almost every state in the union and uh, some of them several times. Uh, you know, we traveled in the northwest and the west and and the northern tier and so forth. So, you know, I uh, it's it's a wonderful country, but uh, we're we're satisfied up here, and this is this is where we're this is where we're doing our thing up here. Okay. Yeah, I guess in that time frame, it was the mining was where geologists and all that were getting snapped up. Nowadays, it's uh, the mining, or excuse me, the uh, oil field seems to be where a lot of the geologists end up at nowadays. Yeah, the the metal mines and a lot of the a lot of the old mining areas have either played out or or uh, uh, they they've gone overseas. Like a lot of things, I mean, there's some big big zinc mines and iron mines and so forth overseas but i think you're right uh, the environmental aspect and the oil and, and gas companies uh have, have taken up the, the majority of geologists now i think i had i had my choice between oil in new orleans and copper in the up of michigan and i'm i'm absolutely uh, glad that i made the choice i did because it's been it's been a good career for me okay all right, so you said that you guys are mainly breeding for halter horses. Is that what you pretty much always That's bred right. for? Well, I, uh, uh, in the the, the early uh, in the seventies and eighties, I was doing more foundation Appaloosas, and I concentrated on leopards. So I, I bought leopards horses and bred leopard horses from all over the country and uh i still really enjoy the leopard horse and the you know the colored aspect of it uh but we've gone uh, you know from the foundation breeding to the more modern breeding and it's uh you know when you when you when you're breeding for a certain uh, color or whatever you take what you get you know you can breed leopard to leopard and get solid everybody knows that now you know and uh didn't used to understand it, but we do now. So it, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to, to get what we're after, but, but I've got a wall full of pictures here. I'm looking at of ones over the last 20 years or so that, uh, you know, high colored that have won, you know, world championships and so forth. So that's, that's what we're about is trying to meld the two together. And, uh, you know, it, things keep changing too in the association and so forth, but we, we do what what pleases us, you know, and uh, we feel there's a lot of people out there that uh, that agree with it. So that's uh, that's what we do. Uh, and not that we don't get, you know, our our share of solids and so forth, but we, you know, I think people that 
are really most people are attracted to the Appaloosa because it's a colorful, a colorful breed. And, uh, you know, whether it's a, uh, a sport horse or a reining horse or whatever it is, people in the Appaloosas would prefer to have a colored foal or a colored horse, you know, if they got their choice, but it's whatever nature hands out to you sometimes. Right. Yeah. I know with us, we look at, what's going to make the best horse you know if we have a mare sitting there what stallion's going to complement that mare or uh, with our stallion what mare is going to complement our stallion so we kind of look at it more from that perspective of what makes the best horse possible that we can put on the ground and then i guess to us the color is kind of secondary. I'm not, it's not really secondary, but that's not the most predominant thing that we're looking for. And yeah, it's great if we can get a horse, a fold that's got color and got the confirmation we want on the ground. But I think we're a little bit more focused on producing the best quality horse we can put on the ground. And it sounds like you guys are kind of that way also but it's just you kind of well, got the color thing going on too <laughs> well yeah now you're you're talking like uh like about my wife julie you know she's from the quarter horse industry and she analyzes these horse uh, horses down to the last hair and, and what cross is going to make what with what bear absolutely you know and i generally you know go along with that i mean we've been we've been breeding mostly to quarter horse stallions uh because mostly their offspring win the win the uh, you know the, the uh, world championships and national show and so forth. But uh, you know if you've got a uh, which is uh, there's few and far between now. But if you've got a good few spot mare, a good one, you know, and uh, cross it with the best quarter horse, then then you can really get something that people will. I mean, you see these babies in, uh, on the Facebook and so forth and. If you've got a really good colored one, you've got hundreds of people responding to it, you know, and uh, no trouble selling it. But, uh, you know, uh, the strictly solids, unless you're really into a certain uh, discipline in the breed, uh, you know, they may be there a little longer. But uh, so that's, that's my feeling about it anyway. But, uh, you know, each, to, to each his own, the Appaloosa breed can, uh, can, uh, com- can uh, accommodate, you know, a lot of different disciplines and types of horses uh uh you know when <laughs> when my dad was breeding horses he would apologize that if the horse was going to be 16 hands you know they were supposed to be 14 too you know and things have really changed a lot over the last 50 60 years so but it, there there is room for you know for everybody in the breed anyway yeah i don't take any credit for our breeding that's my wife i mean i'll i'll, I'll say that straight <laughs> up and down um, and yeah. she's the, the people who listen to the show know she came from the East coast. She was a East coast hunter jumper. Yeah. So she is obviously attracted to the larger horses, but she looks for confirmation first and then hopefully we get right. color out of it. But we're, you know, we've only been doing this for a few years now. So we're, uh, uh-huh. we're just now starting to get into it ourselves and get into learning everything. Yeah, it'd be nice to put some color on the ground. We got one that just hit the ground the 30th, on January 30th, and she's got four white socks and a big, thick blaze on her face, and so far, that's the only color she has. <laughs> uh-huh. We're like, okay, well, all right, we'll see what happens. You know, we'll see if she doesn't start varnishing out or something like that when she starts getting a little bit older. Sure. Well, you know, that's another thing that's really changed radically is now you test for this, you test for that, you test for the other thing, and you can kind of control a little bit, uh, you know, what you're going to get by by testing the, the siren dam and knowing what they're capable of producing as far as color or, or HYPP or whatever, you know, whatever you want or don't want. So yeah, that that's certainly a, a new aspect to the to the breeding. But, uh, right. So you were talking about you used to do strictly foundation. Uh-huh. I was talking to a gentleman last week that he's really big on the foundation. He does endurance and he was talking about how quickly they recover that they are actually really good endurance horses because 
of how quickly they recover, especially long term, you know, day after day. Uh, did you have you noticed that also? Well, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, uh, again, we're just breeding for halter, but and so and neither one of us are uh, physically uh, able to do any riding anymore. But so I'm not a good one to to ask that. But you know, back in the day, I mean, my dad was pretty clever about breeds. He did uh, a lot of different breeds of of horses and dogs and, and waterfowl, and he, he liked uh, you know he liked uh, his animals a lot. But the the original Appaloosa was was kind of a a, a mountain horse, you know, for, for the nuz fairs. And they had to be good disposition that you could ride with a thong in their mouth, and they had to have tough feet because they, you know, they didn't put shoes and this and that on them. And and so they they the ones that didn't uh, muster up to that, they I don't think they ate them, but they did they didn't breed them, you know. I mean, they they prefer the ones that would do the do the job for them. So. I, I still kind of feel like that uh, you find a, a, a disposition aspect in, in a lot of the Appaloosas, and uh, you know the the the, the strides. There's some. There's quite a few of them. That, I mean, we never use shoes here except for the ones that go to the big bigger shows. But uh, you know, I find very few foot problems with them, and uh, uh, and if uh, especially if they're out natural uh, to a large degree, I, I just don't. You know, I've I've been here on this place since '76, and I have yet to have a horse colic here. And we've had as many as 30 here at a time. You know, so I mean, there's uh, I I still think they're a, a whole a, a healthy, you know, tough breed to to a large extent. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we're doing this five panel stuff now. Some of it we take more seriously than than other aspects of it, but uh, that's probably a good thing to know know what you're getting into. I know that's kind of one of the controversies, especially in the halter. Sure. The five-panel HYPP, does that bother you to have that in a horse, or would you rather stay away from it? Yeah, we, we prefer uh, not to not to use it. Uh, and, you know, I know it, uh, it can be, uh, uh, you know, you can feed appropriately and so forth for it, but we just, uh, uh, we've just decided to go that that negative route on it uh you know we don't condemn others that do, that do what they want to do but uh that, that's our decision yeah yeah i was told and i don't know if there's any truth to this or if there's maybe a little bit of truth i don't know that the hypp if they have it they have a ten, they have a tendency to muscle up better and to have a larger yeah. muscle and yeah. i don't know if that's yeah. true or not i'm just <laughs> that's what i was told yeah <laughs> Yeah, we've heard that uh, for a long time, but uh, there there are lines that uh, would would uh, negate that, uh, like the yellow fella line, and some of them, you know, they're they're negative, but they've got some of the best muscling in the breed. So it it may it may have a it may have an effect on on some of, but uh, not enough that that we uh, you know we're still happy with the like I say the yellow fella lines and some of the others, plenty of muscle. And you know it's changing a little bit too. Uh, I, I mean, you, you can get a well. I used to call them Arnold Schwarzenegger horses. I mean, you can get horses so heavily muscled that they might look good, but what what can they do? You know, if you want to do something with them, uh, it's just I don't. You, you know, they're not really riding horses or jumping horses or, or whatever. So, but I've probably said enough there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a oh, sticky. Okay. That's a sticky spot. It, you know? it is. It is. Yeah. It's a, it's just like with a uh, herd of, you know, people talk about that it gives better movement. And again, if you get yeah. into it, you can really get yourself in some serious trouble. So, yeah, I, you know, I've talked to different people that have different ideas on that. So, like you said, to each his own, I guess. And we'll kind of move on from there. <laughs> yeah. But so. I know what I hear from people, I've been hearing from people a lot, particularly the people buying horses, is they want something that is not just one discipline. You know, they want something that can go from halter to some type of riding uh, horse, whether it be ranch or trail or whatever, but they they don't want, basically, what I say, a one-trick pony. They want something that's that's more usable longer, longer down the road. 
I'm glad you're hearing that. Now you're going back to the older days a little more. You know, they used to bring a, a good horse to a show and show it the whole through the morning and then show it in trail or pleasure or whatever in the afternoon, you know. And now that shows are, well, some of them are so expensive, you'd like to be able to do do more with your horse once you get it there. You know, it's wicked expensive to get a horse to a to the world, say, for instance. But uh, And that's that's our breeding philosophy. I'm I'm a wicked one on hawks. I mean, I just that's I want to see the best hawks possible, and and then uh, you know short backs and, and nice necks and so forth, and a good croup and all of that. So we figure, you know, if that horse is correct in all of those uh, structural things, then you can do a lot with it. You know, if it's if it's uh, deficient, uh, sorely deficient in some of those aspects, and you know, it's not going to be able to perform for you once you're done haltering or whatever so i definitely agree with that right yeah it's funny that you say that because um my wife like i said she's she was a hunter jumper that's one of the things she looks for is hawks also because that's yeah. important for a jumper or a hunter if you're going if you're going on the flat you know you're asking your horse to collect and to drive from the rear then obviously you got to have a good engine back there pushing and, you know, yeah. same, same thing for a jumper, you know, you got to have that power to go over the top of the jump. And if they have bad hawks, then, it, you know, it's going to be problems down the road. So, I, yeah, I think that's the hardest thing to get correct in, in horses in general. Yeah. You see so many that are out of whack and I just, I don't, it's one, it's my pet peeve. I just can't, can't look at them. So, <laughs> yeah, that, like I said, that's, I've been hearing that a lot. Like you said, it's so expensive to get to the world or even to show heavily nowadays that I think people yeah. are getting into the spot where they can't afford to have multiple horses to do stuff. They want one horse that can do a multitude of things. And like I said, I, I keep hearing that over and over and over again. So, you know, maybe they are kind of going back to, like you said, the old ways to where you got one or two horses that perform well in a multitude of things. Yeah, that uh, I was just going to say that ranch riding is kind of a kind of a uh, thing in that direction. I think if I understand it right, yeah. Yeah, the ranch riding's gotten real popular. I noticed at World this year that the ranch riding classes were the biggest classes. I mean, there was there were times where I'm like, "There's too many horses in the ring." Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were that's unusual. Yeah, they they were going around at a at a. Uh, I would call it a canter, but uh, going around in a canter, and I was like, "Man, this is almost on the verge of being dangerous." You know, you watch them going yeah. around, and I was like, "I don't, I wouldn't want to be in that ring." Of course, I'm not that proficient yeah. at riding, so. Yeah, well, I like them because they're they're uh, moving in a more natural way, in my way of thinking. Yeah, right, they're, right. They've not been not been forced into anything artificial in the movement, you know. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think that's probably another reason they the ranch riding's become popular. That and you can basically pull your horse out of the field. And you don't have to have, you know, the fancy uh, rail jacket or the all the silver on the the saddle and all that kind of stuff. You can basically take your working saddle and put it on your horse and go out there and do ranch riding. All right. I think that's a big appeal to a lot of people. I know it definitely appeals to me because it's like you know I can use my working tack that I normally use on my horse and I don't have to go out and buy a real expensive yeah. saddle, you know? So it appeals to me. That's for sure. <laughs> and it, uh, and, and you don't have to, uh, spend a small fortune on somebody, uh, sending the horse off for training. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that is a small fortune. Trust me. I know about that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess, what would your recommendations for somebody just now starting out, whether it's showing or whether it's starting breeding, what are kind of your lessons learned, I guess, along the way, or what were some of the top ones that you, that stand out to you? Wow. I hadn't thought of, I hadn't <laughs> thought of, of that, but, uh, hmm. well, yeah. You know, uh, and well, like for instance, we sell a horse to somebody in who knows Minnesota or whatever. There's a lot of trust involved 
in horses and buying and selling. Not everybody can fly coast to coast to look at a horse or look at several horses before they buy one and so forth. So what I'm saying is you're going on, on reputation and, you know, everybody, uh, been in the business 40 years is going to have somebody that feel, feels like maybe they did you know didn't get exactly what they ordered or whatever but by and large people's you know reputations go with them and and they're they're worth checking into so you know uh some <laughs> i've seen people that just gotten into appaloosas and they'll bring one to the world and they, you know their father was in was in banking or whatever and the horse, you know, they don't know a thing about it, but the horse is worth sixty thousand dollars, you know. And somebody might believe that, but uh, you know, uh, check check into things before you take the plunge. That's for sure. Uh, <laughs> get involved, you know. Get involved with your local people in a club or whatever. Get on, you know. Get on uh, Facebook or these different things and see, you know, see what's out there. See what people have to say before you take the plunge. And that, you know, that's one of the things my wife was always. Oh, yeah. Well, what do you want to do? You know, what do you want to do with a, a horse? You know, so try to get a clear goal in mind of what you think you'd really enjoy. You know, uh, don't go right out and buy a seventy thousand dollar halter horse if you really wanted to ride a a ranch horse. You know, right? Well, I'm glad you said so, that. I mean, I think that's something that's lacking not only in the horse business but in business in general nowadays is your reputation. You know, people seem to yeah. lost that. Uh, sense of having a good reputation and customer service. I think that's lacking everywhere. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that all the time. I know when we bred our mare for the first time, uh, and she ended up producing our, our stallion who won high point yearling this year, we obviously used Mad Desire, who's owned by Johanna Downs, and she's one of Bruiser's biggest fans. But her stallion manager is Cindy Polly of CNC Performance Horses. Man, I'm gonna tell you what, you wanna talk about somebody that gives great customer service. They they're awesome at it. It was one of the best experiences that we could have had with somebody like that. Yeah, I mean it makes a it makes a big difference. And I don't think people realize how big of a difference it makes either. Yeah, you know, one of the greatest pleasures I get is it just seems like every year or two, somebody will call me or they'll send me a picture. Uh, you sold me this call back in uh, 1993, and he's we've had him here ever since. He's a member of the family. We love what he does for, you know, that that just makes it for me. And, you know, when people come by to, to see, to visit, you know, not necessarily for the horses, but people that enjoy the same thing you do it, it you know it makes you feel good makes you feel worth you know that what you're doing is worthwhile so that's where i get my greatest pleasure is not not winning a blue ribbon but uh, necessarily but but enjoying the horses with other people you know yeah yeah i understand that yeah that is always a concern is where is that horse that you're selling going to end up i know there's been a lot of problems yeah. with yeah. that on you see it on Facebook and stuff like that, that a lot of halter horses are ending up in uh, kill lots and stuff like that. Of course, yeah, of course if yeah. you also re you look into it, you realize that, uh, I'm not going to say a lot of them, but some of them aren't actually at kill lots. It's actually people using that as a marketing scheme, I guess. But Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen either way, that. it's not good. It's not good for the industry. It's not good right. for the image. but. Well, it's like, uh, you know, the puppy mills or whatever, I suppose. You know, you don't want to breed so many that you have trouble finding homes for all of them and try to be more exclusive in what you do breed. This year, I'm trying to cut back. It's hard. I'm really trying to cut back. But, you know, you want to keep doing what you've been doing. But anyway, we, we bred uh, three mares. Just, they all were in the heat the same week. I think I told you that earlier on. But uh, And we picked out the very best stallions that were entered in the futurities and so forth. And, and we're like you uh, were saying, selective about who we crossed them with and all of that. So, you know, left some mares open, but uh, that, that's the way we decided to go and be the, you know, do the very best with that we can with uh, fewer numbers. So that's that's where we're at right now. Yeah, we've got three coming due all in the same. They're like a week apart. 
And I was telling my wife, I'm like, right. I don't know how we're going to deal this because we only have one broodmare stall. <laughs> I mean, we got we got four <laughs> stalls in our barn, but we only have one broodmare stall. And I'm like, uh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but well, I guess we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah, been there, been there, done that. But what you know, what we do is to check them two or three times a day and try to predict the day that they're going to fold by the wax and the behavior and so forth and so on. You know, and have the one that looks most likely in the biggest stall. So that's what we. Try yeah, to do. that's that's a that's a game sometimes right there. <laughs> <laughs> and one year I remember we had uh, two of them and okay so the one fold about eight or nine o'clock at night and we looked we opened up the door in the stall next door and the mare snaked her head around and looked at that mare and foal and then she fold <laughs> it was just you know it's like she said okay my turn because she so, thought it was safe right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We were all there to help her. Well, now, you... Yeah. Oh, they're funny. They're, go, yeah, and go so ahead. you mentioned the faturities. Is that a big deal to you? Is that something that you guys... Uh, I don't know much about it, but I guess I'm I guess I'm going to learn. Uh, yeah, our, our trainer out in Ohio there, he took a uh, gelding, I don't know, yearling or something, gelding, and, and in a couple of classes, won 30,000. So, you know, I guess it is a big deal now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've never been to one, but I, I see them on Facebook and I hear my wife talking about them. So, yeah, that's what we're uh, this year. Yeah, we chose a, a couple of stallions that were booked in all those securities and and going to let our trainer see what he can do with them. And uh, I don't, you know, I, I, I don't suppose I'll show in them, but I'll probably have to show at the world again. But uh, anyway, that yeah, that's the. Uh, yeah, we, we've had horses that we've offspring you know showing futurities but this will be the first time for us i think okay to try it with one of our own well yeah. that was one of the questions i was going to ask is if you guys show outside of the aphc if you do any of the futurities or anything like that outside of the aphc but i guess that kind of answers the question you might be this year <laughs> yeah we do now yeah <laughs> well, I know we bought one Philly. Well, we didn't. My cousin bought one Philly that was uh, for the Breeders' Halter Futurity this year. She didn't win $30,000, but she did win some money. She basically paid for yeah. her entry fees and her ride up there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, that does right. seem to be a big thing is people seem to be snapping up all the horses that are able to go into those fraturities. And if you do fairly well, it doesn't hurt when you're ready to sell the offspring. Right, too, right, so. right. Yeah, and we uh, we recently, I don't know if you know, but we bought chocolatey a little while back, and so we're kind of getting involved with the fraturities now, too, because... You know, he's nominated for yeah. a lot of fraturities, and so then they're calling us up asking us, hey, can you donate a breeding and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's kind of trial by fire for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, beautiful oh, horse. Thank you. You got there. So that's kind of the story of my life uh, and the long and the short of it. But that's what we do because we can't help it. Right. right. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, I know – Back when I first met my wife, she was training, you know, she was teaching uh, riding lessons and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, yeah, it, you know, we'll we'll kind of probably phase out of it or whatever. And then here we are today, and we actually have a breeding operation going on. So I guess I was fooling myself on that one, right? <laughs> yeah, right. right. But like I, I, I've said before, she's the heart and soul of the business. She's the one that picks all the mares and she picks all the stallions and i'm just the guy in the background fixing right. the squeaky wheel you know so all right well um i can't really think of anything else unless there's something that you think we should hit on or the area that we should cover no just uh stay the course and uh, and we'll see you so we'll see you down the road right. somewhere, somewhere well if right. your world we'll definitely be there because right. our uh our stallion uh oh nominated Good. well he's in for world again this year so right. we'll definitely go back for yeah. that not really too sure what we're going to do with him in between we definitely we're getting ready to send him off to a trainer to get him going under saddle because uh, like like you uh -huh. we believe in that um we want him to do more than just be a halter horse 
So I know that's kind of counterproductive sometimes, though, especially when you're trying to do it both at the same time. <laughs> yeah, but uh, good for their minds as well. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I agree yeah. with that because yeah, him staying around in the stall most of the day is his right. entertainment is us when we come in there, and that doesn't make it easy when you're trying to clean his stall and feed him. <laughs> right. <laughs> my uh, okay. my boss's mom bought him a rubber chicken the other day because she has two stallions and she's like i bought this for my stallion and he loves it and it keeps him occupied while i'm in there uh, and we went in there and handed it to him and he started it we got a, a video of it on facebook with i'd say within two minutes he had the head ripped off that sucker i'm like okay oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> but all right well thank you sir uh so if anybody wants to learn more about your program or about what you guys are breeding and selling, where can they find out, find that information? Just, yeah, go to Facebook and just put in my name. K yeah. John Kreider, K R E I D E R. And it'll pop right up. All right. Do you guys have a, a website? Uh, yeah, I, I think she's still keeping that going. Although most people, yeah. Sawyercreek.com. All right. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for your time and you bet. hopefully we'll catch you guys farther on down the road you will okay thanks for that Tony bye bye Well, that brings us into the show. Thank you for listening. I hope that you've enjoyed the show and that we'll see you here next time. Please share the show with your friends. Go to iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, any of the major podcatchers and subscribe to the show. And while you're there, give us a rating and review. This helps us make it to the top of the list where we will be seen by more people so we can pass along how great the Appaloosa horse is. If you'd like to contact me, would like to leave a suggestion for a show topic, or have somebody that you would like me to interview, then you can look us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash Appaloosa Media. You can find us on Twitter at Appaloosa Media, or you can email me at Appaloosa Media 1, that's one the number, at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and have an happy day.